So without further ado this afternoon, I'm now going to hand over to Colin Wakeford from XRite. So Colin is the team leader, Applications Engineering North Europe. And today's webinar is all about cutting edge color matching solutions for paints and plastics. So over to you, Colin. Thanks, Anne-Marie. So cutting edge color matching. Uh, I'm going to break this into two sections, really. The first uh, half to talk about uh, software and the second half to talk about uh, spectrophotometers, or the, the instrument side of things. So to start off, uh, just a quick uh, couple of slides on who x right are, for any of the audience who might not know. Uh, x right was formed in 1958. Its first product was actually X-ray marking tape. Um, whereby um, a portion of the, the X-ray um, or the X-ray slide could uh, be written on. In 2006, X-ray merged with Gretag Macbeth, bringing in uh, the Gretag and the Macbeth lineage of spectrophotometers and densitometers, and also uh, Munsell Color, bringing all the color standards uh, from that side of the business. And then a year later, 2007, uh, acquired Pantone uh, to bring in all of their color standards as well. Today, x right is owned by the Danher Corporation, which has three main uh, areas of expertise, life science, diagnostics, and uh, environmental and applied solutions. Uh, we fall into the product ID group, along with VideoJet and ESCO. A couple of well-known names there in there, Beckman Coulter, uh, Leica, uh, names you might recognize. Our worldwide headquarters is in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. We have a European headquarters in Regensdorf, Switzerland, which is the old Gretag headquarters. Uh, we have European sales applications and service offices here in the UK and Manchester, uh, two in Germany in New Eisenberg and uh, Munich, uh, one in Italy in Prato, in France and in Spain. We have sales offices in China, Hong Kong, and Japan as well for the Far East. Over 600 uh, staff working worldwide. And we offer color solutions in, amongst others, uh, paints, plastics, textiles, print packaging, paper, cosmetics, food and beverage, automotive, which is a big area, uh, photographic and design markets, which can bring together uh, all of our suites of software and different products, uh, things like the Pantone range, etc. So, uh, back to the thrust of uh, today's seminar. Why do we need co uh, digital color formulation? Well, so I'll be preaching to the converted, I know with some of you, but for those who are maybe less familiar with it, it the idea is to reduce development time for new formulations, a quick recall of existing formulas, the ability to search databases uh, for uh, a starting formula that might be closest to a new color. So you might receive a, a standard from a customer and think, okay, this seems quite familiar to something we've done before. So instead of the old fashioned way of going through a fi dusty filing cabinet full of old recipes, you can search the database and find something that be within an acceptable uh, color tolerance, either to use directly or uh, to correct that to a closer uh, approximation of the color you're looking for. We can select formulations on set criteria, things like uh, metamerism, use of specific colorants for um, outdoor, indoor, high light fastness, low toxicity, uh, food grade, um, FDA uh, approval, things like that. We can also optimize the color palette and therefore reduce cost on inventory held um, in the company. And also, um, again, for a cost saving, uh, optimize color loading in recipes. So instead of overloading something, we are actually being more cost effective in our use of pigments. Fandic formulations, so you might have a full BS4800 range or an NCS or a Pantone or a Mansell range of colors, and you can formulate them all uh, just stack them up in the software and set it running. And finally, uh, to reduce the over-reliance on one experienced colorist within a company. 
Uh, when I first started uh, with Macbeth many years ago, one of the things I found was a little bit of resistance when I went into a company because many colorists felt that the color matching system might be actually um, threatening their job. Uh, and it, it's not that in any, any way at all. It is a tool to be used. It will help the experienced colorists to maybe find routes that they hadn't thought of before, but it will also allow the less um, experienced or less trained uh, people in the laboratory or the production area to do formulations and corrections based on a set of criteria that could have been set by the experienced um, head of lab or whatever it is. So they don't have to be continually um, being sort of uh, pestered, if you like, uh, for uh, opinions. So, uh, the main thrust of the first section of the, the presentation is the X-Rite uh, iMatch or iControl family of softwares. It comes in a number of different levels from a basic QC level up to a full functional formulation level, uh, which allows a customer to uh, come in at a price point and a functionality level that suits what they want to do, and they can always upgrade at a later point. Maybe they come in at a QC level um, with the idea, yeah, one day we want to formulate, but we're not at that point yet. And rather than yeah, a year, two years down the line, having to buy a complete new software, they can just upgrade the license within the eye control, which will then open up the functionality to allow them to color match and correct. The iMatch software itself has both multi-flux or many flux, depending uh, what your name you're familiar with, and Cabelcomonk uh, math engines. Um, we could spend the rest of today talking about what these mean. There are plenty of papers out there available. Really, the main thrust here is that Cabelcomonk traditionally always assumes that all your opacity and your coloring comes from a white. So if you've got a white, you've got an opaque color. If you've got no white, you've got transparent color. Now, for many years, that worked fairly well for the majority of colorants, but now we're into areas where there's a lot of translucent colors, both in paint and the plastics applications, which is where many flux gives a lot of advantages because what a many or multi-flux model will do is actually assume that there is a degree of opacity comes from every component within your colorant file. So your base, whether it be a transparent, translucent or opaque base, your white colorant, but also all the other colorants as well. So this leads to a better optimization of your colorants to uh, achieve less than full height uh, colorants uh, or final recipes. So we can do transparent, translucent and opaque materials all within a single database, either in reflectance, which might be uh, for full opacity as a single measure or over light, over dark, contrast cards for less than full height, but also transmission mode as well. So for plastics, it can be the application. Are you doing a, color, a plastics which is going to only be seen in reflectance, whereby we could do an over light over dark, or is it going to be seen backlit and as signage within a building for doors, exits, etc., where the transmission characteristics of the color will be as important as the reflectance. So as I say, a flexible colorant database, which allows us to uh, fine tune the absorption scatter coefficients uh, to give more accurate first time matches. Again, it's one of the big developments that's happened certainly in, in my career. When I first came into uh, color matching, basically your database had a set number of samples. It either worked or it didn't work. Um, hopefully it did work, in which case that you as a customer would be happy with the matching results if you're in this less than full hide or more than fully transparent mode, there was a chance that, you know, you might be uh, getting to the point where it's not necessarily as accurate as you would like it to be. With a multi-flux model, um, the database is as flexible as you want it to be. We can start with a set number of samples, see how accurate they are, but if they're not giving the optimum accuracy, we can add more samples in particular areas within the database to improve the uh, first time matching. So again, as I said, probably two slides ago, with paint we can measure either in a single measurement mode for fully opaque samples, 
which might be fully opaque because they have you know a single layer which is at full opacity or multiple layers to give full opacity because that's what that particular application allows let's say for external uh, protection on steel structures uh, things like that or it might be over light over dark for translucent samples uh, again as i said to optimize pigment loading and give us to a target opacity and again uh, repeating myself uh, in the plastics we could be measuring over light, over dark, if it's for reflectance only measurement or reflectance transmission, if it's backlit or even transmission only, again, for backlit or uh, translucent samples like uh, colored liquids, etc. All databases, whether it be the, any of these paint or plastic uh, type applications can be created with or without a clear base. For example, in a ready mix paint application, the base will be the white, um, so it's not necessary to always have a clear component in there, which might be a dummy, but isn't going to be as, there's no need for that at all. It will be a um, database as it is, as you would use it in your, um, your lab and your factory. And also um, colored bases, of course. For the majority of painted plastics applications, we would recommend using one of our benchtop instruments, the Color i 7000 series. Uh, Sphere-based spectro comes in a number of different uh, specifications for whatever your application is from the CI7500 instrument, which is a reflectance only. It doesn't have a transmission capability through the 7.6, 7.8 and uh, 7.860, which is the highest uh, mat, uh, repeatability inter-instrument agreement, highest accuracy. So as you go up through the range, you get... Um, more improved accuracy, but you actually get more uh, function um, flexibility in terms of apertures available, going from uh, 7500 with just two aperture options through to the 7860, which has five. And also with the UV cutoff, uh, more flexibility there as well. So if we're in reflectance, um, we shine the light into the the sphere, uh, diffuse the light, which the diffuse the light, which then falls on the sample, reflects off the sample, and is picked up by the detector. Here we're measuring over um, a white backing, and then over a black backing, which might be uh, a drawdown on a Lanetta card, or it might be something which is backed with a physically white and black tiles, for example. Um, if we're going to do a plastic, if we do it in reflectance transmission, again, here we have in the reflectance position with a white backing, uh, as we did in the paint sample, but then we move the sample into the uh, transmission port within the instrument, so it, the sample sits between the diffused light in the sphere and the detector. So a bit more about the software now, different screens. It's fully integrated QC module with the formulation correction. So everything can flow backwards and forwards between these three screens within the software without having to do some measurements in a QC module, come out of that, then go into formulation where we might have to recall data again from a file, uh, which can be quite tiresome if you're going back and forward. So if we look at here's a screen which is depicting the QC screen within the software, which I'll explain a little bit more or more about in the next few slides. So we have mix A here, which is measured as a standard. If we want to formulate this, we can go straight to the formulation screen where you can see that standard is still live. And then we can do all the settings for the formulation that we need to do, which again, I'll come back to and make a formulation. Now we can, go away, make that up and bring it back to the software. We could measure it directly into the correction uh, part of the program and see what the delta E is and then make, if we have any correction to make. Or we can go back to the QC module and we have more flexibility and more detailed QC functionality. So here you can see that we have the delta LAB, uh, delta E CMC and pass fail and some graphical representations. If we go to the uh, correction screen, you can see that we have the standard and the trial both live within that if we're going directly from the QC screen. And then again, with preset um, 
correction uh, options, we can then carry out that correction and we can go straight back to the QC module again. So as you can see, we have a, a, a three tier um, set up there, which we can move quite seamlessly between the three options. The soft, these options, these three options, all fall into what we call an e-job, and that is the heart of the uh, IQC and iMatch softwares. Uh, these jobs allow us to, it's like an old-fashioned job ticket gone digital, allows us to measure a standard into that job and then measure each batch of uh, production into that and pass fail them and then build up a historic trend over that particular product, or we can have multiple batch uh, standards within a job, which might be of a particular design. Uh, so you're doing a product for a customer that might have two or three colors in it, put all the standards into that job, save it under that product name, and then every time you measure a particular batch of that color, it can be associated with the appropriate standard. Now, if we go to formulation correction, that gives a second and third dimension to these jobs, which again, will all that data, all those formulations, corrections will all be saved within that job, which can then be um, brought back later and added to or um, reworked. We also have um, Pantone Live, which is uh, can be attached or can be set up with the iMac software, which allows us access to range of predefined digital Pantone Fandex, which allow us to bring in standards um, and then formulate them from there. When the eye control family was designed, it was quite clear that uh, we don't live in a perfect x right world where everyone's using x right software. There'll be a number of uh, competitor softwares out there, which may be in the supply chain. It might also be that there's other softwares which require the data, whether it be a design system or some other color management system. So there was a number of ex import and export functionality that was put into the software to allow us to send data out in predefined uh, formats, which allow uh, easy import into other softwares. And again, import into uh, I control from in predefined formats from other software. We can also send data out to Excel spreadsheets as well if uh, users wish to design their own reports uh, and put some uh, calculations in there, which might be uh, unique to their particular operation. So the QC screen itself, uh, it's fully customized or configurable. Um, so I, I know myself, I've in the past used softwares where I want to maybe see the color metro data, the Delta LAB, and Delta E, uh, C Lab or CMC of whatever equation I want to use, but I also want to see a uh, C Lab color plot and maybe a reflectance curve as well. Uh, and I've worked with softwares that had predefined screens which didn't allow me to see all of those at one time. Within the QC part of uh, eye control, we can set that up whatever we want. We have a number of different uh, screen options which can be pulled up and configured whether we put on the screen. Um, resized and positioned. We can also within the, the top half of this highlighted part of the screen, we can choose what color metric data we wish to see, uh, whether we want, um, you know, just as straightforward uh, C-Lab values as we have here, but maybe absolute values and delta values. We might want to put in as we have here a pass fail, but we might want some comments, time and date, a whiteness value, a yellowness value, which would be quite important for plastics, uh, opacity, uh, metamorphism. Again, you can have more or less information depending on the situation and uh, who's looking at the data. So, uh, as I said bef before, we can carry out the colorimetric data and other indices there. As you can see, we can have different formats and each job can have a different format as well. So we could have a number of jobs open all at one time, which again removes the, the painful situation where you might be working in the lab on some color and someone else comes in and says, okay, I, this is an important job. I need to um, get this pass failed now and you have to close, save everything you're working on, close it down, let them close up their um, or open up their job, do what they do, and then close it down and go back to where you were. Here, all you have to do is open a second job 
Uh, it might be a pre-existing job, or it might be a new job. That second other person can do the work they want to do, uh, and then you can go back to yours without uh, having to close anything down. So here we have, instead of having the uh, C-Lab plot and the reflectance curve, we've moved the C-Lab plot to the bottom right, and we've got an on-screen color representation here. And we've added a time and date uh, onto the colorimetric uh, data screen. All right, here's another one which has got rid of uh, all the, uh, the scientific graphics, if you like, and just put up a color representation. representation. But here, over a black and white background, if we're working on uh, less than full height samples. The color and editor, which has been improved in uh, the version 10 of iMatch, which came out at the end of 2019, gives us a full range of um, quite clear diagnostic information, which allows us to see how the database build has gone. Here we have, the for this particular blue sample, we've got the mixes from 25 to 32. Uh, in the numeric uh, screen, we can see a back prediction of uh, concentration, strength, and delta E. Um, so obviously, uh, the lower the delta E, the more accurate the back prediction. The strength calculation here, we're all well, well within five plus or minus five percent of all the samples. So um, that could be deemed as as um, accurate enough. Um, we've got then on the top right uh, the reflectance curve build of those samples. Do we have a nice ladder of samples there? Do we have data filling in all the spaces from the most pastel shade to the darkest shade. There might be that there's a gap there or some crossover. If there's a gap, we can then identify that as maybe somewhere we need to add additional data. If there's some crossover, it might give it, be giving us some conflicting information so we can then choose maybe to eliminate a sample from the data set and see how that uh, improves the final pred uh, predictive performance. And then on the bottom right, we're looking at the KNS data and the smaller of these little, uh, what my American colleagues call barbell um, icons there, um, the less sort of statistical uh, variation we're going to get, which will show that we've got a better accuracy there. That's the sort of thing that we as application engineers spend a lot of time working with our customers on to um, get their database to a point where they're happy to, to run with it. it might uh, be an ongoing process, over a, a period of months or even years, we've got customers who are still tinkering with these things, trying to improve them. And obviously if they introduce new pigments, they'll want to go through this as well. So onto the formulation screen, all of the samples which are live within the QC screen will be live here. So then if you've got a range of standards, you can choose between them, or as I said at the very beginning, you might want to do a fan deck, in which case you would click just uh, the, where it says targets, just above the, or just behind the red box, and it will select everything, and then that will be sort of uh, set up for future formulations. Then with colorants, we can manually select them, or we can select the whole lot, or we can have predefined groups which are set within the calibration option. There is a rules feature, which I'll come to in a second, which uh, benefits that. Substrate, it may be more than one substrate. Again, because we're matching or allowing a matching, it takes every component into consideration. We might have like a just straight Lynetta card, uh, or it might be some other substrate, which might be like an undercoat or, or something, or some colored background of some sort we would want to use as part of the final color effect. And again, as I said before, uh, you might have this database has only got the one base in it, but you might have several bases. Here we've got a, the primary one, which would be the white base, but we might have a, a slightly more transparent one or slightly more yellowed, uh, might be a clear one or might be colored bases. So again, we can select from that. I touched on this before the rules. We can set up a number of rules which allow us to move away from a strict uh, reg regimented sort of uh, group function where in the past we use groups and someone said, right, I might want something which is light fast. Okay, you can set up a group for that. Okay, we want a toy safe. Yeah, you can set up a group for that. Okay, I want something that's light fast and toy safe. Oh, okay, right, you need to set up a third group. What we can do here is just by flagging each individual colorant to say what rules it um, 
applies or applied to that particular colorant, we can select the rules and it will then make groups of groups or more flexible grouping. Uh, so the ones I've set up here are food safe, light fast, toy safe, FDA compliant. By just ticking these boxes, it will cut down on uh, the selection of the colorants appropriately. Batch qual quality, we can do this straightforward batch, uh, or we can do it by setting the resin amount and then it'd be a, like a, a res or a base plus type application, or uh, there is the ability to, to use it as a kind of retail model, although we do have a, a fully uh, specific retail software uh, offering, but sometimes in a, a, a more production orientated environment where uh, something with nice fancy customer orientated screens with uh, what brushes to buy and, and all that kind of stuff you see in a B&Q, um, you can set that up to work with a dispensing system uh, with, with can sizes, etc. In terms of matching, we can set it to predefined opacity or contrast ratio, or we can say we just want a color only match. Uh, if something is going to be a tricky um, uh, match, if we include opacity in it. Thickness, again, we can set everything up with a, a one predefined thickness if it's going to be at uh, like 100 microns, 150 microns or whatever, or we can add in if there is a translucency there, a flexibility to say, okay, the whole database was made at 100 microns, but we want to match this at 75, in which case the, the formulation would then take into account the lower film, the film thickness and uh, adjust accordingly. We have this, is, again, a new feature in the version 10 of the software, a gamut view, what this does is it works out what the color gamut would be for all the colorants you have selected, either manually or with groups, uh, rules, etc., and then plots all the active standards and shows if they fall inside or outside of that gamut. So by clicking on this very quickly, you can see whether you're going to have a, any chance of su successfully uh, matching that color. You might have something that's like a very bright, very clean yellow or something but you only have like a yellow oxide pigment in your database, in which case it would say, um, unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to get the color strength you need. So that would be either, well, we can't match this particular color or we have to add uh, another pigment into the uh, database. Um, and again, that's where the operator's um, expertise and uh, historical judgment would come into place where they would say, well, yeah, yeah that color might not be as light fast uh, as we'd like it to be, but it allows us to achieve the colorant. So we'll go with it and see what happens. When we actually run the formulation, we would then see a uh, formula based on what we call the optimum score, which I'll come back to. Uh, we can output this to the printer or dispenser or a text file. And again, the data or the display output here is configurable. So I've, in this particular example, just cut it down to percentage amount and a delta E and a metamorphism figure, but we could have more information here if we wanted it. And as I mentioned, if we stay on the screen, we have a, a number of uh, QC graphics, but not quite as, as uh, flexible or as in extensive as we would get if we flip back to the QC screen. There's also a show all button, which allows us to see all the formulations which have fallen within a delta E tolerance. That again, we would, we would set in the formulation setup. Uh, it might be that what is coming out as the best recipe might not actually be one you want to go with because there may be a colorant there that, you, ah, we've just run out of that, but there's another formula in there that maybe has uh, a not, an alternative blue or in, in this green or another yellow or, or, or something. So something that maybe, again, based on the, the user's experience, appeals more to them. It might have a very slightly higher optimum score based on the delta E or the metamorphism, but it's still within uh, tolerance. Once, uh, when you start using uh, iMatch, 100% of your formulations will come from first time formulas going through the screen we've just been at. As, as a user, you begin to um, make successful formulations, either a, a first hit or an, a correction or two, you, and you're happy with those, you can then add them 
into the database to be available for a search and correct. As you can see here, this Formula One, uh, I right clicked on it, I go to properties and I tick the search and correct box, which allows me then to have that available for um, future formulations. And I'll show you in a, a couple of slides time how we can actually select the route we would do the formulation, whether it would be just a first time formulation, a search and retrieve or a search and correct. So as a user begins to uh, work more and more with iMatch, from going from 100% of first time matches, you can start to introduce the search and correct or search and retrieve to the point where maybe you know, several years down the line, the majority of what you do is search and retrieve or search and correct rather than first time formulas because you've built up quite an extensive palette of save formulas which will give you something that's quite close to a lot of the colors you'll be working with. Again, it saves time and it's a formula that you have trust in because you've made it up, you've looked at it, you've applied it, it works well, the customer who bought that color was happy with it. So you're starting from a point of, of greater um, expertise or greater um, trust in that color. So as I say, if we go to the settings, we can decide whether um, we want to see uh, just a, a color output or maybe what we call uh, color plus basic materials. So you might have antifungal agents or dryers or some other non colorimetric uh, component that you would like to see in the printout of the, uh, the formula so that the operator who's doing the mixing would, would know to add these things as well. Uh, the number of decimals used, obviously internal, we've got internal for accuracy, but we've also got external uh, or viewed uh, decimals, which might be in, uh, keep it in, in line with a dispensing machine, for example. We can display the recipe uh, with or without resin. So uh, it might be that you're using pre-filled cans or uh, canisters where there's already resin in the can and just want to dispense the color into that, although the formulation would take that into account in the background. And as I said on the last screen, the order of matching, we can tick whether we want to just match only, which would obviously be what you do at the very beginning. Search and retrieve if it's within, and here I've got uh, 0.1 delta E, so I've got working with a very tight tolerance. Or search and correct within one delta E, which is uh, still an acceptable um, distance that you probably get something that you would be able to correct. And of course, there's the ability to add new colorants if you feel that, uh, yeah, it, you maybe want a wider tolerance, um, but uh, you know, you'd be able to bring it in with some uh, additional colorant. The sorting of the recipes is based on this uh, optimum score, which allows us to choose three metrics from this list. And then uh, we might choose uh, well, spectral shape. What we're doing is matching the reflectance, measured reflectance curve of the standard. So what that will do is inherently reduce metamerism. And it's seen by our mathematicians as a way of getting a more accurate color match. It might be that you want to go with uh, Delta E, um, C-Lab, CMC, Delta E 2000, whatever, metamerism, cost, whichever three you choose, you can then rank them in terms of importance with these three slider bars on the right hand side. So if we choose uh, cost might be the most important. Um, the metamerism might be uh, of lesser importance and then uh, the delta E somewhere in the middle. Which again, let's say will affect what comes out as the, the best match. And then if we look at select or show all, it will affect the ordering of that. If you have something which is off shade and it's just a, a sort of a, a pot of paint, you might just put it in as a standard and correct it. If it's a much larger, uh, larger um, amount, let's say a 45 gallon drum maybe, you can then add it as a waste, which with a single measurement would actually add that into the database and could be used as a colorant and work it off over a period of time. So the correction screen, looking at that in a little bit more detail, as I said before, the standard is live from the QC through the formulation into the correction screen. The trial, we've probably gone and made up the initial formula, tested it, 
shown that it does need a correction. And again, that will be live in the system. Or if it's not, we can use the plus sign uh, there to actually go and measure it in or even pull it back from a database. The formula will have been stored against that standard as a working formula. Again, that will be live. Uh, and if you, you know, if you have to go to a second correction, there will be the formulation first correction will be available and you can choose which one you want to go from. Select those directly and just hit correct. Um, and we'll get the correction screen. And again, that can be uh, customized to get the data we want to see. Uh, and up whether we want to do an addition to batch or if we're just doing a small development uh, uh, amount for a new recipe, we might want to do a uh, a new recipe each time and just make it up from scratch. If it's an addition to batch, we've got minimum maximum quantity, which allows us to take into account a headspace in a can. We don't want to end up with too much color on the floor of the lab. We can fix resin amount. We can do a color only. Again, correction, if, if opacity is seen to be a stumbling block on us getting a, a good color match to something, we can decide whether we want to new, add new colorants or not. Uh, obviously adding new colorants does lay us open to um, least or less or more metamatic colors, let's say. And so we can choose all these options. And as I said before, we can choose what uh, colorimetric metrics we show in terms of uh, the output here. I've included strength in this case and uh, to make sure that the correction is not going to be end up uh, making the color uh, too strong or weak. And again, once we've done the correction, we can send that, uh, we can customize what we see, but we can also send it to a dispenser or to a printer. Batch recycle is just a quick way, again, from a single measurement, we can take a color that maybe we don't know what the formula for it is, uh, but we've got an idea what colorants are in it, make that measurement, select the colorants and make a correction from that, or select the colorants we think we would choose to correct that to a shade. Okay, that, that kind of concludes the, the bit on the software. What I'd like to talk about now is the MetaView, which is a, a kind of new generation of instruments. I mentioned before that normally we would uh, like to work with one, or normally recommend one of our benchtop instruments, depending on the application, whether it's for, for uh, paint and reflectance only, or uh, plastics with reflectance transmission. The MetaView is a non-contact imaging spectrophotometer. Why, why non-contact? Well, I think uh, a lot of people here today might recognize these sort of problems uh, or challenges. Here we have uh, a portable uh, handheld instrument with a sample we want to match. It's got a pattern on it. If we're very lucky, like in this case, we've maybe got enough solid color within that pattern that we can actually measure it with the, the fixed aperture size on the instrument. It might be that it's uh, awkward shaped or um, sized instrument, um, sorry, not instrument, sample. In this case, we're placing the instrument onto the sample, but we can't see if we're actually measuring the holes or, or the solid color. And finally, you know, trying to cut corners in terms of waiting until the paint dries. And obviously, uh, this uh, poor Color I2180 has had several not quite fully dry samples uh, stuck in the front of it over a period of time which uh, makes the outside of the instrument look a bit interesting. But if that paint starts getting into the integrating sphere uh, and coating the barium sulfate inside there, it gets a bit expensive in terms of uh, repairs and uh, you're not going to get the sort of accuracy measurement you want. So the MetaView or VS3200 um, non-contact spectrophotometer. As I said, non-contact, why non-contact? Well, sorry, go back a slide. We've got this ability to measure wet and dry samples with not, you know, obviously not touching the instrument and contaminating it. Um, interestingly shaped plastic samples, for example. Um, again, non-contact allows us to position the instrument a little bit, a bit more flexibility. Cosmetics. Um, um, as I always say when I talk about this, I did show my ignorance on cosmetics many years ago when I asked someone at Boots how long it took for lipstick to dry. Um, 
and I was quickly put right on that. So something where you can position a, a lipstick uh, stick or some powder, um, which again, if you get in contact with the instrument is, is gonna make a bit of a mess. So what does this imaging spectrophotometer, this HSI, hyperspectral imaging spectral do? So here we have a sample, which again, unfortunately we don't have enough of a solid area of color to get into the, the full aperture and we've actually uh, crossed into a second area of color. So on a traditional spectral, what it does is it averages these two colors and gives us what we can see in the top graph and the top color representation there. What the MetaView will do is actually analyze both of these areas of color and gives us two separate distinct standards from that. So as I said, we, we have a hyper spectral imaging spectrophotometer. It is a, a 45-0 measurement geometry. Uh, all non-contact is uh, with a sphere. You have to have direct contact between the sample and the sphere for accurate measurement. It has LED illumination. It acquires sample image at each wavelength. So it's unlike a traditional spectrophotometer, which shines 100% of light across the 400, 700 nanometer spectrum, I measure what comes back. What um, the MetaView does is essentially take a picture, a photograph at each wavelength, and then constructs a traditional 400 to 700 nanometer uh, curve from that. So it's 31 points of data, so it fits in with that traditional measurement uh, technology or style like aperture sizes or well, aperture size is from 2 to 12 millimeter it's not fixed it's a zoomable um, from 12 down to 2 um, I'll show you that in a minute we have on-screen targeting which takes away the challenge we had before with the uh, plastic chair with the holes in it we can actually see what we're measuring and then position the sample accordingly as I said before with non-contact measurement something which is wet or delicate or interestingly shaped, fragile. Um, I did have some interesting experience with this instrument last year measuring uh, old master paintings, um, where obviously, as you can imagine, uh, no one wants to take their Renoir, Monet, whatever, and then stick a lump of plastic or metal on top of it uh, to make a measurement. Uh, so you want something where you can have uh, a bit of, no, a few millimeters of distance between the surface and the instrument. And we have uh, ambient rejection. The way that the uh, geometry is set up, the illumination, it takes out all ambient uh, lighting. So here is the optical engine. We have uh, three illuminators, which uh, the design for the MetaView was primarily for retail paint, where people might bring in interestingly shaped or applied color samples so like some paint which just slapped on a bit of board and it's maybe not nice uh, smooth surface so it will take out all any shadows that are cast by any texture uh, it might be like a piece of uh, fabric or a piece of carpet or something which will have a greater degree of um, light uh, shade in it Sample positioning, the, we'll see that in a minute. The slider at the bottom has an integrated bit of uh, calibration tile. So it actually takes that into consideration when it's making the measurement so that it gets the, the position of the sample correct. The light, when reflected, passes through a filter wheel, which gives us these um, so like digital images. And then we have the camera sensor. So as I said, it's location aware with this built-in uh, sort of white calibration surround. The slider, which you can see highlighted in the top right picture there, that is the locator. But the bit that which is um, just poking out the back of the instrument that is actually the calibration tile. So if you pull that slider all right forward, you'll be able to do the calibration. The LED technology here allows for a much greater calibration interval than a traditional spectral. With this, you can get to a, a once a week calibration. Um, I'm a bit old school. I like to calibrate instruments on a daily basis, but um, the MetaView allows you to do it once a week. And if you're in a, a retail uh, environment like a B&Q, 
which is where this instrument in its MetaView uh, guys will be going into uh, probably next year to replace uh, our pre-existing iViews, which if you've ever been into one of the bigger uh, B&Q stores with the uh, Valspar paint set up, uh, there's one of our uh, little brick things there, which is uh, the iView. Um, but with here, they can do the calibration once a week. So if you're a retail environment with less uh, color, color trained staff, they just have to uh, worry about the calibration once a week. Obviously, you can slide that slide it all the way back to get into the optics uh, to clean up any ambient dust that might be around in the environment in the lab or the, the shop or whatever. And there's sample flattening, which is, again, part of the, the sliders uh, kind of use there. So you don't get any dog-eared uh, samples or fan decks or whatever. So how does the measurement work? So as I said before, 31 point of data. So here we have a target sample. And it takes these uh, images all the way through 400 to 700 nanometers. So if we take an image from the, the green portion of the sample and go through each of those uh, 31 points, we can create a spectral curve from 400 to 700 nanometers for that green standard. Obviously what that then allows us to do is to analyze multiple spots within an image like this and then create multiple standards. So if we're working on a single color, what allows us to do is to take out any flaws within that sample, whether it be striations or uh, contamination within any lumps of uh, unmixed pigment or uh, dust or, or whatever's got onto the sample. Um, and it allows us to remove gloss and shadow, uh, let's say artifacts here. And let's say it clusters light colors together to be able to separate out these individual colors in a multi-colored multi image. So here's three examples of smart color extraction from the MetaView. So simple color averaging on a fan deck, that's quite straightforward. The dominant color ex extraction allows us to take these uh, four solid colors out of this image and save them as four distinct standards. And on the bottom here, we've got a bit of uh, concrete or whatever, whereas you can see when we look at that there, in that image, if we did it on a traditional spec photometer, we'd be getting an averaging, which would end up a slightly darker shade than the, the kind of dominant color that we actually want, which when we view by eye, our eye is picking up the, the sort of background color and not the, the flecks that are within that. So what the MetaView will do is pick out that dominant color. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, here's a piece of carpet. So if we looked at it in the more traditional form, which is the top left-hand image there, we would get an average sort of quite a dark green color. But what the MetaView will do is pick out the dominant color, which in this case is, is, is um, not so many pixels, but it will give us the color we want taking out the, the shade and everything that's coming with the texture on, on that uh, sample. Red stucco here, where we've got either um, a lot of, shadow interaction or there might be a small flex in here which are giving sort of sparkle effect and again if we average this out we'd end up with a color which is lighter than what we'd be wanting whereas if we go for the dominant color we take out all these uh, effects from it and get the color that we're looking for which is again slightly darker richer than it would be on the averaging we've also got this appearance compensation function which is gives a bias towards the lightness and the chroma to, to again give a better agreement with what we would see visually. So we use that for fabrics and, and stucco paints. And here's a bit of blue molding, which has got like uh, striations in it, a bit of the, um, uh, say the grain of the wood showing through, which again would have an impact in traditional spectral photometric uh, reading. Whereas again, if we just pull that dominant color out, we can get the color we're actually looking for. Within the, the IQC iMatch software, we, we have the ability, the smart, what we call smart spot capability, which allows us to A, preview the color on screen. And in this case, we have uh, a woven fabric sample, but it's got a number of different colors within it. 
we can um, either use the uh, smart spot uh, or the dominant color extraction, I should say, which allows us to pull out those three colors separately, or we could zoom in on a particular area. So the larger uh, focused area there is the 12 millimeter aperture. We can go all the way down to two millimeter and then move that spot around within that circle to just get exactly the spot we want. It might be a sample that has got, uh, or it's a poorly applied sample and there's only a, a smaller piece which is actually deemed to be good enough to get an accurate measurement on, we can use that. Um, I've also suggested to uh, users of the instrument that they could place a sample underneath it and using the two millimeter, they could do an averaging without actually have, ever having to move the sample, just move the, the two millimeter, millimeter spot around it. So here's some examples, some real life examples of colors that have been matched using the, uh, the MetaView. So we've got this, um, which I'm not entirely sure, say it's soap lift, um, some sort of uh, fibrous sample which has then been uh, made into paint and applied down to a, a contrast card. We have a piece of uh, fabric where we picked out the green spot and matched that. And then we have a piece of material with uh, Ninja Turtles on it. And we've taken the dominant background for each of the squares there and produced the color off it. Benefits of non-contact measurement. I've kind of covered this already. Uh, prevents damage to samples. It might be that they are wet or fragile or very expensive and you don't want to damage them. Potent prevents contamination of the instrument. Eliminates drying time, which is one of the, certainly the interest that uh, potential customers have shown in the instrument. Basically time is money. You make a paint, you have to wait till it dries until you can see whether that formula is a good formula or not. If it's not, then you have to correct it and then you have to wait till it dries again. If you accelerate the drying, you're probably going to change the color and it will be inaccurate. So if you can actually measure the sample wet or not fully dry, but naturally a natural dry, sort of short and drying, uh, drying time, you're cutting time out of the, uh, the process and saving a bit of cash. And again, the ease of use. Um, there's some accessories for the instrument, which I'll show in a minute, uh, like an adjustable uh, height stand, which allows you to lower the instrument down to appropriate height on different sized or shaped samples, or there's ways of uh, placing like powder samples, liquid samples to the instrument. It can also be used for inline measurement, which is one of the great benefits of non-contact measurement. If you're doing something that's in a continuous process like lino or a paper or something like that, you don't want to stop the machine every 30 seconds or so to do a, a QC measurement. You can just keep it going and uh, do this. We, we have a customer who's measuring large uh, marble type um, slabs and uh, they, they were using the inline uh, type process. So when the stuff comes in the door, they can do a measurement and it just goes forward into the factory. So different applications, lab matching, as I said before, eliminates drying time for each correction cycle, speeds up the point from going from a starting formula to uh, an acceptable match. Production, again, verify color without waiting for samples to dry. Again, big time saver. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, samples that don't ever dry, cosmetics, uh, colored liquids, things like that. And it can be for formulation or it can be a way, again, for quality control where a color change in like a liquid or something would be indicative of some contamination or something. So again, um, very easy to use uh, application. So here's some uh, specification details on the, the instrument itself. Non-contact, 400 to 700 nanometers, 30, uh, 31 points, 10 nanometer uh, instrument, uh, 10 nanometer interval measurement. Uh, Inter-instrument agreement, uh, 0.15 average C-Lab. Uh, white repeatability, 0 0.025. I'd say the measurement spot, zoomable from uh, 12 to two millimeter. Line of sight targeting within the software, which makes it very easy to use and very easy to position the sample. And so on, yeah. So here are the uh, accessories I mentioned. The instrument stand, 
which you can see on the left hand side with little uh, spoons which can uh, be used for powders. You get spoons with white and black backing which can be used for liquid samples. Again with the stand you're getting a continuous, accurate, repeatable positioning. The adjustable stand which can be used for, um, we've used this with uh, let's say uh, famous old paintings, uh, cosmetics, um, and awkwardly, or not awkwardly, but differently shaped plastic parts where you can raise the, um, the platform up and down. It has uh, a measurement ruler at the left-hand side, so you can always get it to the same height for the same type of sample. And then finally, on the right, the bench top stand, which basically turns the instrument into a, a bench top instrument where you can place samples against it, which give, for some people gives the benefit of a bench top instrument and a non-contact. Uh, measurement when it's horizontal. So, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I guess I hand back to Anne Marie now if anyone has any questions. Okay, Colin, thank you very much indeed. Um, an awful lot of information in this presentation, and I know that whilst we've been watching, there have been a few questions coming in, so I think we'll just uh, we'll head straight to those if that's okay. Um, yep. So the first question comes from Phil Christie from Wilfred Smith. Um, he's talking about measurement of metallics. Now right. I know in your second part of the presentation you talked about this appearance compensation, but will it will it handle metallics? Is the question. Um, this instrument. Well, if you've got a flip flop in the metallic, no. Um, if there was just a, a, something with a, a kind of an effect finish, like a brushed aluminium, but didn't have any direction, color change, oh, I'll start again, any directional color change, then the instrument wouldn't pick that up. Uh, if it was something with a, a kind of sparkle in it, it if it was a, a silver, it would just look like gray. Um, from the formulation point of view, matching metallics is the holy grail, if you like. That's kind of where we want to be. Um, and uh, yeah, we can't do it at the moment, but uh, people are working on it and hopefully, x right might be into the market with that a bit of head. Actually, we, having said that, we do have a thing called auto search and correct, which is a kind of diff, totally different uh, tool with our multi-angle spectrophotometer. It does do a metallic search and correct. So we've kind of got the second bit, but not the first bit. Okay. So yeah, I think, uh, you know, automatic, or oh, full formulation for metallics for the automotive industry, I think is, is uh, a big kind of, let's say, on a lot of people's wish list. Okay. All right, well, there's a, there's a second question here from Phil. Um, he's saying, guessing a database of bases needs to be inputted for various resins, etc." Yeah, yeah. For, for the database, as I said earlier, it, it is a flexible database, but the multi-flux allows for that. You kind of take one base, mm. and create uh, each individual colorant within that. that. That's the sort of thing that we as I said before, we as application engineers work closely with the customer who buys iMatch and, and, and comes up with the, or gives them the initial recommendations. They go away and work on that. And then we work together to, to modify that down. And, you know, if they've got other bases, we would introduce them as alternate bases, which normally involves just a couple of mixtures with the white, with the calibrating white and the calibrating black. Um, so, yeah, it can be... The old days, like I said, it either worked or it didn't. It was a very short sort of process, sometimes very successful, sometimes never successful. The new stuff is um, takes a little bit of time back and forward, but we hope we get to a point um, with much better uh, sort of first time matching from the sort of word go. Okay. Now we have a question here from Joanne Cumbo from um, Sherwin Williams, the old Lee's Paints. Uh, asking, right. what is the cost of the MetaView? Uh, the MetaView itself, I think, uh, you know, I'm an application guy, so I'll just give you the ballpark figures. It's about 10 grand, I think. Uh, and the software, you know, again, as I said, the I controls a family. You go from like the basic QC model uh, through to the full matching. Um, you know, for what we call IQC Pro is about 3,000 pound and the full matching is about 10,000. Okay, and a second question from Joanne. Will MetaView work with data match pigment? 
Um, you'd have to ask Datacolor that, to be honest. Um, we, we have a number of competitive devices which are supported by our software, but uh, um, it'd be up to Datacolor whether they've uh, um, included uh, the drivers. So yeah, ask Datacolor. Okay, and then um, a final question here from Phil Christie. Have you worked with pigment suppliers so their pigment colors are used in the database? I know you said that you know you have this um, pre-select. You can pre-select pigments for color fastness or light fastness, etc. But actual bespoke pigments per pigment supplier is that something that's been done? Um, no, not really. I think um, in the textile industry there is a number of uh, dye stuff suppliers we've worked with and created kind of off-the-shelf databases, which then a dye house will pick up on, and, and you, because they're working directly with that dye stuff supplier. With a paint company, for example, or, even, or a plastics master batch, normally we would always look to produce like a bespoke database with them because their pigments or their pigment range, their bases, uh, the, their substrates will all be unique to what they do. So really we have to build a database that fits exactly. Um, we have been asked, definitely, but I, I would normally always say to a customer that your pigments will probably be potentially from a range of uh, pigment suppliers and your bases might be from someone else. Uh, you might change them every so often. So it would be impossible to basically have a, an off the shelf like that. It's a wee bit different in automotive where instruments are sold by the paint suppliers to like, a, like an auto repair shop basically tie them into their uh, colorants. The ink industry is a wee bit like that as well. Um, although the, the bespoke nature of the database kind of holds with the ink companies, but in the auto refinished, it's kind of, yeah, here's our database with the spectral and you have to buy your colorants from us. My experience is paint makers nor, or paint companies normally, yeah, they have to build their own. Okay. Okay, well, I think that's the end of the questions for, from here and um, so all it remains for me to do is to thank you so so much genuinely it's been a great presentation and um, thank you for taking this opportunity to come with us and we look forward to welcoming you back in our autumn series all being well my um, pleasure and just for the people out there watching just a reminder that uh, two more left in this summer series of webinars uh, so next week is BASF colors and effects talking about royal effect pigments and our final webinar of the series on the 26th of August is Maflon talking to us about innovative fluorinated solutions and um, just a reminder to everybody watching today that Colin's presentation will be available for download as a recording and also a PDF of his slides we'll be sending you a quick link with the questionnaire for today and after that you will be able to download um, if you missed some of it, you can go onto the OCA website as well via the members area and download. If anybody thinks of any more questions that we've missed, you can contact myself or we'll also give you um, Colin's contact details and you can get directly in touch with Colin. So thank you very much indeed, everybody, and see you same time, same place next week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.